So, guys, uh, it brings me uh, great pleasure to uh, uh, to introduce our guest speaker for the night. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Nicole Buchanan is a professor and a clinical psychologist who has written many articles and book chapters and helped hundreds of men and women empower themselves and put their emotional financial lives on track. After starting her Wake Up Now, or Wake Up Now in August, excuse me, her team has literally exploded with members in several states. She already saves hundreds of dollars and earns residual income every month with Wake Up Now. I've known Nicole for close to 30 years and I am honored, honored to have her on our team so all of us, including myself, can learn from her in hope to not only better ourselves as individuals, but also grow our team with the knowledge she shares with us tonight. So I, so make sure that you guys all take copious notes as she speaks tonight. Nicole, are you with us? Nicole, if you're uh, with us, I need you to star six. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Take it away. The call Wonderful. is yours. Well, first of all, I need to clarify that I'm not quite sure how Mike would have known me for 30 years, given that I just this again for roughly 19 years in a row. So um, it's amazing. Some of the things Mike brought up, he has no idea what I wanted to talk to you about today, but he really couldn't have given me a better segue into my talk well, because uh, I want to talk to you about how to enhance your private persona, which will then result in you having a positive change in your public persona as a business person. So in essence, I want to focus this talk on how to change your basic thoughts, your habits, your behavior, and do all of these things to help you cultivate a success mindset. So my goal is to talk roughly 30 minutes or so and then save a few minutes at the end where you can ask questions related to what I'm talking about. And I'm going to ask you this to be very good about meeting your phones now. And after we open up for questions, that ask you your question, go ahead and put your phone back on mute. So when you look at network marketing, network marketing is probably going to be similar to some of the things that you've done in the past. And in lots of ways, it's still going to be very different from anything you've done before. And some of the skills that you've learned elsewhere are going to still apply, but there's a lot of the skills that you need that won't necessarily already be there. And so no matter where you're starting, you're going to need to grow and to develop these new skills in order to really be your best at network marketing. And this is part of, in my opinion, what makes network marketing so special and why I love it. I've not seen any other profession where there has been such an amazing focus on professional development and personal development and how these things work together. So I've watched people grow in just a matter of weeks or months, changing from someone who presents themselves as, as fairly negative, as unprofessional, and they transform themselves into being positive, upbeat, and a professional business person in a matter of months. And I simply don't see that anywhere else in any other profession. Equally important, the skills that you're going to develop in network marketing are going to translate into every single thing that you do in life. They're going to be evident in all of your daily activities and your relationships with others, and even on your J-O-B if you're still stuck in a J-O-B. The main barrier, however, the main barrier that I see at least to your growth and your development in this field tends to be our very own thoughts our beliefs, and our self-imposed limitations. And this is where people like me, psychologists, come into play because the research we've done shows that we, we as people have a great ability to change and to grow. And that even as adults, we can change our basic personality, such as if we're basically pessimistic or optimistic, we can change the way we think, and we can refine our basic skill sets and our abilities. Now, this does not mean that you're suddenly going to be some great mathematician if you struggle with multiplication and division, but it does mean you can be much better, you can be confident, and you can be confident in your abilities if you commit to working on those basic math skills and the way you think about math and the way you think about your math abilities. And these are all things that you can change about yourself, that you can learn to do, and you can learn to think about differently. 
So there are two important pieces of who you are in this business and who you are in life in general. The first one is your private self-image. And this directly impacts the second piece, your public persona. So today I'm going to share with you some of the research literature on personal change and achieving success. And I'm going to give you for free some of the things my clients pay me thousands of dollars to teach them and help them implement over the course of a full year. However, I'm merely sharing this information. It's going to be up to you to do the work every single day to put these, these ideas into action. And just like lots of my clients have me to work with them regularly to help them on this path, I'm going to suggest that each of you find a mentor or life coach or a psychologist to work with to help you improve on those domains where you want to grow so that you can have a rock solid success mindset. So the very first step to developing a success mindset is doing a real honest, in-depth self-assessment. You have to be honest with yourself and I would suggest you find someone who you know and trust will be honest with you to help you think about where your challenges lie. So ask yourself, what is the image you project to the world? If you were to look at, say, your last six months of your public image from Facebook, what would that public image say about your private self-image? Are your messages on Facebook hostile? Are they sometimes vulgar? Are they pessimistic? Or are they inspiring and positive and thought-provoking? The way you present yourself publicly speaks volumes about how you are privately and about how you see yourself. So there's a young man on my team named Tom Theory, and I am always happy to see him having an update on Facebook because these updates are positive, optimistic, goal-oriented, and they're upbeat. And even when he has something to say that's not terribly positive, he discusses it in a thoughtful way that sparks and stimulates thoughtful conversation. When you get to know him, you see that this is a perfect reflection of how he is as a human being. This public representation of him matches the private self-image he has, and this reflects his way of being in the world and reflects his success mindset. And this, he's an, he is a great example of the way you want to present yourself but you have to get there in order to do that. So thinking about how you present yourself publicly and how that reflects what you feel about yourself personally and internally. But from there, ask yourself questions like, what is it people think when they see you coming? Do people see you as someone who complains a lot, someone who is self-centered, someone who is a dream stealer? Or would others describe you as being savvy? upbeat, thoughtful, trustworthy, helpful. Next, think about things like what would people say if they found out they had to work with you on a project? Would they talk about you as being hardworking, considerate, good with deadlines, someone who tries their best and gives it their all? Or would others see you as someone who cuts corners, not really a team player, maybe they slack off a lot, doesn't, doesn't pull their own weight, lets other people do all the work? This, in many ways, gets back to what Stephen Alexander talked about two weeks ago. He talked about being the ace you want to have on your team. And what I'm saying connects to that basic concept. You want to be the person that other people see as positive, genuine, interested in others, being dedicated and a helpful team player. These things equal success, and they reflect a strong success mindset. So you need to find ways of being the person you would most like to work with. As a second part of the self-assessment, you need to determine what are your beliefs about your life, your beliefs about your business, and then ask if those beliefs actually propel you towards achieving your own goals. Our beliefs absolutely influence our behavior. Unfortunately, this is also problematic because often we're not even conscious of what our, really, our beliefs truly are. For example, do you really believe in the network marketing business model? 
or does some part of you believe that it's really just a scam or that only a few of those really lucky people are going to be successful? How you answer those kind of questions, how you answer them really in your heart of hearts, this is going to be reflected in your approach to your business. Do you believe that success is, say, the result of luck or just hard work or some predetermined destiny? Sometimes people recognize that other people worked really hard to be successful, but then when they think about this for themselves, they think they're only going to be successful if they're lucky. These kinds of mindsets can actually cripple you and cripple your business. If you believe these things, why would you work hard and why would you consistently put in effort if you don't really believe that what you do is actually going to have an influence in changing things for the better? So in psychology, we talk about this as your locus of control, which is a fancy way of just saying, what do you believe is in control of something? So if you have an external locus of control, you believe something outside of yourself will determine your future. Maybe it's luck, maybe it's destiny, maybe it's a deity, but there's something else in control of what's going to happen in your life. It's likely to do all the steps you need to do to be successful. Because, again, in your heart of hearts, you don't really believe that you have any control over the outcome. Now, in contrast to this, there's those who have an internal locus of control, which basically means that those individuals believe they are the captains of their own ship and that they can change things for better or for worse based on their own actions and behavior. So if you believe you can actually improve your own condition, and, and this does have to be paired with a desire to positively change your condition, these kinds of beliefs will actually foster a desire to work hard for what you want and to keep working hard, even when things are much more difficult than you imagine. Most of us will have some kind of combination of an external and an internal locus of control. And it may actually be different based on what you're talking about. So people will have one kind of locus of control if you're talking about health, maybe another approach to control, who's in control of their life if they're talking about running a successful business or being in a healthy relationship. What's important is that you get a really thorough understanding of what are your true beliefs so you can begin to challenge those beliefs that limit you and strengthen the beliefs that motivate you to work harder and to keep working for as long as it takes to be successful. So third, you also need to think about what drives you and what motivates you. And be honest with yourself. Are you somebody who is really driven and motivated by getting verbal compliments from others, from having other people say what they think is great about what you're doing? Do you like being the person that others seek out for advice? Do you get excited over the prospect of making money or being a good leader or having more freedom, whether that's time freedom or financial freedom? You have to know what motivates you. And what motivates you is going to be closely linked to your why, and that's a capital why. Why did you join this business at this particular time in your life? This why, this has to be at the forefront of your mind at all times. You need to write it out, say it out loud, come up with a 30-second version that you can tell others quickly, and you need to repeat it and practice it out loud over and over again until you can communicate your why easily. Last week, Amy Jo talked about the same thing. She talked about your why should make you cry. And I love that phrase, your why should make you cry. I completely agree. Your why should be strong enough that it elicits a strong, visceral reaction within you. Your why will be your driving force in all that you do. So you've got to make that why meaningful. It's going to be the center of your motivation. Others will see your drive. They will see your passion. And it will be inspirational and motivational for others. Your why speaks volumes about who you are and who you want to be. So think about it really carefully. So I'm going to take a moment here and I'm going to get personal. 
most people look at me and they don't understand why I would even consider being involved in network marketing. By almost anyone's standards, I already earn an excellent income. I have a doctorate. I speak around the world. I've published dozens of articles and books. So what few people see is that I work 70 to 80 hours a week. And when I leave the door and my two-year-old is reaching up to me, asking me to pick him up, I just wince because it physically hurts to have to walk away from my family to go put in another 70 to 80 hours another week. And I wince when my husband wants to go out salsa dancing. We're big salsa dancers. But I have to tell him I can't go because I have yet another deadline that I'm going to have to work all night to meet. So for me, my why, my capital why, is time. I can have all the money in the world, but I have no time for the people I love the most. The very people that I'm working so hard for don't get what they want most. They don't get me. I reflected on the last 11 years since I've been working after getting my doctorate and realized I don't want this anymore. I don't want to live this way. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to keep saying Hold on, family, I love you, but I'll get back to you once I've made enough money, once I've published enough articles, once I've done enough, I'll come back to you. I want the way I live my life to reflect my values and reflect the fact that my family is more important to me than anything else. And so to do that, I realized I'm going to need a residual income. And I'm going to need that residual income to meet and in all honesty, hopefully even exceed my J-O-B income, so that I can become rich not only financially, but more importantly, I can be rich in my time, and I can be rich in the experiences I have with the people that I love the most. And for me, that's my why, my capital why. You need to become intimately connected with your why. You need to make it real. Think about it daily. Visualize how your life will be different when you have achieved your why. Make that image something you ponder daily, and you're going to find that you become motivated and driven to do anything when you have fully connected to that why. You will cultivate a success mindset because your why has driven you where nothing but success is acceptable. The fourth element towards developing your success mindset, I'm going to say from the outset, I recognize it is counterintuitive and that to be successful, you have to identify what you're most afraid of. Most people live their daily life protecting themselves against all those things that they fear most. Doing this limits you. You cannot live and be free if you're focusing on protecting yourself from your fears all the time. So you might imagine someone who is afraid of talking to strangers, they may go through extremes to make sure they do not have to talk to a stranger at any point in time. And I've seen people who have elaborate processes for having other people make phone calls for them. They always make sure they have things with them so they can look busy in public so no one would dare to approach them. They don't go to new places. They don't go to events, all to avoid what they fear most talking to strangers. This is actually the worst thing you can do when you're afraid of something. Avoidance makes fear grow stronger and makes it spread to more and more areas of your life. When you're afraid of something and then avoid it, it sends a message to your brain that that fear is legitimate, that that fear makes sense. The avoidance actually convinces your brain that it is smart to be afraid and that your brain should do even more to protect you from having to feel fear. So instead of avoiding the things that you're afraid of, you have to directly challenge your worst fears. And you have to do this every single day, and you do it in little ways, and you do it in big ways. You challenge your fears and do the things that scare you the most. So going back to my earlier example, 
if I have a client that is afraid to talk to strangers, we come up with a list of daily assignments they have to do to challenge their fear of talking to strangers. And this includes actively doing the things they don't want to do. So making phone calls every day to talk to some stranger and ask a question. Going to stores and having to talk to people. Joining a group like Toastmasters where they're going to have to speak in front of a group. And eventually taking on bigger and bigger tasks that directly challenge that fear. When you're doing those things that you fear the most, you're actually retraining your brain to recognize that nothing terrible is going to happen. Now, you can make this even more powerful when you pair doing those things that you're afraid of with things like taming your anxious thinking. So reminding yourself that things are going to be okay, that whatever happens, you can handle it, and that the fear is just your anxious brain trying to control you. You can also pair it with things that control your physical reactions to fear, like doing deep breathing so that you can stay relaxed and calm. When you do all these things, especially when you do them all together, that fear begins to go away until one day it's either completely gone or you've gotten to the point where you so easily manage it that it's no longer a factor in your day. That's you another form of freedom, freedom for a life that is ruled and limited by fear. The other reality about fear is that it's almost never based on a rational, logical thinking process. So if you want to understand the root of all your fears, you have to ask yourself an important question to help you be a little more logical and rational. So one, what is it you're really afraid of? What is the most horrific outcome that you're terrified is going to happen? Second, how likely is this to actually happen? And three, even if it did happen, how big a deal would it really be? When you're living out of fear, you spend most of your time being terrified by worst-case scenarios that have almost 0% chance of happening, and that even if they actually did happen, it wouldn't be that big deal because you'd still be okay in the end. So bringing this back to network marketing, one of the common fears that, network, that people in network marketing have is being rejected. Using this as the example, the first question you ask is, well, what's really the thing that you're most terrified of? Often, behind that fear of being rejected is the worry that you're going to be humiliated and ridiculed, and that those that you value and respect most will no longer value and respect you. Well, once you've identified that that's really what your fear is, it will help you think more rationally about it. So you go to two, how likely is it that that's actually going to happen? Well, the reality is that if you approach people in a respectful manner and you talk to them about an opportunity and you share what you value about them that made you think that they might be good for this opportunity, even when they're not interested, they're rarely going to reject you. And almost never will anybody actually ridicule you for talking to them about it. So the probability of this event happening that was so catastrophic is actually quite low, and it makes it even makes it makes even less sense that you would spend a bunch of time worrying about it and trying to avoid talking to people about this opportunity because of that fear. But the reality is that sometimes that worst case scenario does indeed happen. And so I would go a step further and argue that anyone who actually does behave that way towards you probably has their own issues that they're acting out on you, and therefore any of their accusations or their craziness, these aren't legitimate things for you to be worried about and be concerned and afraid of. So if you use this logic, even if that worst-case scenario did happen, it doesn't have to be a big deal because this worst-case scenario of being ridiculed is unlikely and on the rare occasion when it happens, you recognize that it's not about you. It's that person's limitations. And you don't need to dedicate your time and emotional energy to it. It's simply not that big a deal. Now, there is a lesser fear that is very likely to happen. And it's very likely that people are going to turn you down for joining the business. And that fear or that, that experience of people turning you down actually could be fear-provoking and it could feel like a rejection. This is going to be very common and it's very, very likely to happen. 
And so I suggest something that we call cognitive reframing in the field. In essence, this is a way of helping you come up with alternative ways of thinking about a situation or experience. So stop thinking about this possibility of being turned down for the business as a no. And instead, consider it a not yet. Personally, I've already seen many times where someone who was not interested in this business has a change in their life or they have a change in their way of thinking and they suddenly become interested in this opportunity even if it's weeks or months down the road. If you can reframe those no's and turn them in your head into not yes, you're no longer going to feel personally rejected and you'll be open to revisiting the business with that person again. You'll also respond more positively to their not yet, which will then keep that line of communication open and makes it easy for them to come back to you when they are indeed ready. A second way of reframing a no that can help you not feel so rejected is to remember that your job is to expose not to convince. You are trying to make sure that people understand the value of our products and the potential of this opportunity. You are not there to convince anyone to do anything, especially to start their own business. Because if you're having the work to convince them now, you're going to be carrying them every step of the way. So if you can remember that your job is to expose but not to convince, you'll avoid being as overly invested in any one person's answer to the business. This moves you away from feeling rejected or feeling that you must get everyone and anyone to join one, and it moves you closer to a success mindset because it moves your focus to where you have power and influence. And that's the influence of actually introducing more people to Wake Up Now. So rather than being overly focused on this hurt and rejection, you are focused on where you can be successful. This trip helps you move each not yet into something that can actually be motivating because it motivates you to follow up with them six months later and to get out there and talk to that next person immediately. And all of these things are the kinds of things that build a success mindset. So try to be mindful of the time. To recap, I've talked about enhancing your success mindset by reviewing four key areas of self-development. So one, you have to assess how you present yourself to the world as a person and as a worker. You want to be that person that others think of as optimistic, positive, hardworking, caring, and intelligent. And that's if you want to be the ace that you're out there looking to find. You also need to assess your own beliefs about yourself and about your business. If you can figure out if you have beliefs about this business model or about your likelihood of being successful, that limits you. Or do you have beliefs that will actually propel you forward? You need to see yourself as being in control of your future and seeing that your own hard work can pay off. Conversely, asking yourself, well, does some part of my belief set actually limit my belief that I can change an outcome here? If you do not see yourself as being capable of creating change, then you will not work as hard as possible to be successful. And so you would need to get that changed immediately. The third thing is understanding what drives and motivates you. You have to figure out what your why is. You need to put this at the forefront of everything you do. So dedicate time to visualizing your life when you've achieved your why. And doing this will keep you motivated, keep you dedicated, and help you be an inspiration to others. And then the final point here is identifying your fears and identifying them so that you can find ways of challenging them and directly focusing on living as a fear was not a factor in your life. Taking these four steps to better understand your strengths and your needed areas of improvement and then dedicating time every single day to listen to to addressing them and to listening what you're telling yourself on a daily basis. This is going to grow. It's going to strengthen your success mindset. It's going to enhance your success in this business. 
and in, and really in all the domains of your life. So with that, I want to say thank you to Mike for inviting me to speak with you today. And if we still have some time, I'm happy to take some questions about any of the material I covered today. So if anyone's got any questions for Nicole real quick, uh, go ahead and star six and unmute yourself and ask your question real quick, please. Well, I have a genuine fear uh, of traveling constantly without a cash flow. And so it doesn't pertain to the business, but I'm about to enter a traveling venture 700 miles. How do you overcome that fear? of going when you don't feel you have enough uh, reserve. Are you talking about financial reserve? Sorry? Are you talking about having enough financial reserve? Yeah, right. Because in the past when I traveled, I've always traveled with plenty, and now I'm traveling with uh, not enough in my opinion. It's always a fear. I have a fear of money all the time. Well, one of the first things that you need to do, you've already done, and that's identifying what the fear is, and then going through that exact same list of questions. What is it in your heart of hearts that you're most afraid is going to happen? And then figuring out how likely is it that that's actually going to happen? And then if it happens, what's the big deal anyway? So if it's that I might overspend one, how likely is it that you're going to overspend to a point where you could actually get yourself in any trouble? And are you able to recover even if you were to do so? Most of us find that the things that we're most worried about are things that are not likely to happen, that we have far more control over than we think, and that even if they did happen, we would recover from them. We will be okay. And when you understand that you're going to be okay no matter what, it lessens the fear. Okay. Awesome. Do we have any other questions for Nicole? Uh, I have a question. I'm not sure if I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, can I you hear identify you. yourself? Awesome. Uh, this is somewhat sorry. I just got out of my meeting and uh, I managed to hop on and hear a bit of what you were saying, Nicole, but a question that I have is how do you, I don't know if you've answered this already, but how do you identify while you, say you're in the moment, you're speaking with someone, and they aren't, they're interested, but they're not quite pursuing. So you have a fear of quite of losing them, of that interest, that potential interest that they have, but also you don't want to seem desperate. How do you, how do you, go through some checks in your in your mind of, okay, this is what I need to do or whatever. So if I hear you correctly, I'm identifying two pieces. One, you're you're talking about in the moment that concern that you're kind of losing this person and that you're yeah. going to miss out on this opportunity or they're going to miss out and it's going to kind of be done deal. Mm -hmm. What I will encourage you to recognize in that is something Stephen and I have been talking about a lot recently, and this is the scarcity mentality, and that we have this belief that there's not enough out there, and so we need to desperately go out seeking and scrambling after everybody that we're in front of, and that we become very invested that this person's got to get in. There is no scarcity. If you can get yourself to remember that there is no scarcity, that there is abundance of everything I need, including people to join the business, that I don't have to be overly invested in what this individual person decides to do. And in fact, by not being overly invested, I actually give them more room to think logically about what they want to do and to make a good decision for themselves, whether that is today joining or a month from now or a year from now joining. But a lot of our fears really come down to some domain of scarcity and reminding yourself that there is no scarcity. We live in a world of abundance, and we don't have to be afraid that there won't be enough. Gotcha. Makes sense. Fantastic. Anybody else? 
Okay, well, awesome, Nicole. I want to just say uh, thank you very much for uh, for your time and your knowledge. And guys, I encourage you to uh, go on our team site on Team Living Without Limits. Reach out to Nicole. Send her a Facebook friend request to connect with her if you haven't so already. Um, everyone that's uh, coming to the Christmas party will have the pleasure of meeting Nicole and her husband Steve. They will be there. They're coming out from Michigan.